So I've posted in the chat um, a pretty long but quite profound quotation from Thich Nhat Hanh. I'll be referring back to it a little later on. Um, as I mentioned at the outset, and you may have heard me say, uh, I'm going to be building on what I talked about last week about unilateral virtue in our relationships. Uh, if I think about myself in the realm of relationships, top five principles, useful, practical lessons for myself, definitely the uh, relief and clarity in just resting in and focusing on my side of the street and my aspect of the good relationship and my job <laughs> in terms of being a decent human and living by a certain code, um, you know, living by unilateral virtue, as I summarize it, has been incredibly useful. So if you didn't hear last week, you might want to uh, listen to the talk, the recording, um, as I mentioned in the chat uh, sidebar a few moments ago, a few minutes ago. We post those recordings typically before Saturday morning, and then we send out a link to them um, in a regular weekly email. Uh, and you can hear what I talked about last week. The basic idea is kind of very classic, old school. Um, clean up your own mess, right? Take, take, do your own job. Take care of your side of it. And that doesn't mean leaving out other people. I think of it loosely as the 80-20 rule. Yeah, I put 20% of our attention and effort on trying to influence other people to rise, to try harder, do better, restrain themselves more effectively, see the bigger picture, have compassion, uh, keep their agreements. Whoa, what a concept. How advanced. Keep your agreements. Whoa. Um, yeah, 20%. But what about the other 80%? What about focusing mainly on where you have the greatest influence, which is on your own conduct in terms of uh, thought, word, and deed? The Buddha put a lot of emphasis on one of the, the first of three fundamental pillars of practice in Pali, the language of early Buddhism, sila, samadhi, and panya, loosely translated as virtue, concentration, mental training, and wisdom. Sila was often talked about first. You know, regulating yourself, um, not harming yourself and not harming other people as well. Kind of getting one's own house in order. Um, this is very, very fundamental. And it's easy to kind of blow past it to think, oh, how to-do list, oh, how basic. I learned all that in you know Sunday school already and it was a pain in the neck. This is really fundamental. It's as we grow in our regulation, of body and mind, we become more at peace internally and we become more at peace externally and help others be more at peace with us. Very fundamental practice. The question becomes, how? How do we help ourselves con um, continuously practice wise speech by using words that are well-intended, true, actually beneficial, timely, not harsh, and ideally wanted by the other person. How do we actually do that? How do we move ourselves to operating with an open heart with people whose hearts are closed? How do we help ourselves um, do our duties consistently, impeccably, impeccably? How do we Get ourselves? How do we motivate ourselves to do the things that we know would be good to do in terms of our side of the street, but are hard to get us to do? How can we do that? Well, there are two major ways to get ourselves to walk the higher road. One way is to push ourselves up that higher road of wise speech, wise intentions, wise action, wise conduct, wise livelihood, wise relationship to intoxicants, wise relationship to sexuality, not lying, not taking what is not freely offered, not harming, not deliberately personally killing living beings. Um, we can push ourselves up that higher road. There's a place for that. There's a place for giving yourself an instruction. 
I've definitely had moments uh, where that inner voice of the better angel on my shoulder was saying to me, Rick, don't do that. Or Rick, that was, you messed up and you better, you got to clean that up, man. You know, there's a place for giving ourselves instructions and pushing ourselves, bringing will to bear. That's often kind of where we start. But after a while, it's exhausting. Making yourself exercise, making yourself hold your temper, making yourself not drink when it would be so tempting after a stressful day, uh, making yourself sustain attention to another person uh, rather than giving them your own infinite wisdom or rebuttal to you know whatever they're saying. Ugh, it's tiring. It's exhausting. It's hard. Um, and to some extent, that aspect of deliberate willful self-regulation can reinforce in, in ways that are not ideal that internal sense that there's a kind of inner executive that you're identified with. And from there, it's a pretty short hop to presuming the existence and the centrality of some kind of inner entity or I, which can become uh, definitely problematic in everyday life in terms of taking things oh so personally, and also as you engage upper reaches of practice, and there's a, a growing letting go and opening into everything, that sense of a contracted executive, inner pusher, inner scolder, inner finger wagger, that's not ideal in terms of deepening practice. So what's the alternative? What's the alternative to being pushed up the higher road? It's being pulled or drawn, lifted, inspired, lived, buoyed, Think of it like an, arou uh, an arising fountain, an arousing and arising fountain, whew, lifting us up that higher road. What are some ways that we can actually do this? So that's what I want to talk. That's what I want to talk about with you tonight, especially applied to our relationships. And then I'll open it up, and I'll respond to questions or comments that have come in through the sidebar, the chat sidebar, and I read everything there eventually. Uh, so even if I don't respond directly, you can be sure I will have received your words. That's my commitment to you, all right? That's part of my higher road, uh, certainly tonight and all these evenings. Um, and then I'll hopefully we'll talk with one or two of you at least, you know, directly if you're interested in that. Okay, so two major ways to be pulled toward the good, pulled toward the way we really want to conduct ourselves. But before I say them, I want to encourage you to make this concrete for yourself and know for yourself a way you'd like to be that maybe is challenging for you in a challenging relationship. So know it to yourself. Know to yourself that you want to just, for example, filter out the snark or the eye rolls or the subtle and maybe not so subtle positioning of one-upness in, in, in a relationship. Maybe you want to let go of that. Maybe, on the other hand, you want to rest in a sense of your own worth and your own inherent healthy entitlement to fair and decent treatment by others, and that you deserve to have people keep their agreements with you. You can't make them, but if they don't, that's that fault is on them, not on you. Maybe you want to rest more in that sense of a bone deep assurance and confidence, whatever it might be. Maybe you want to um, regulate how you, uh, how you consume food. Maybe in terms of your footprint on the planet, you want to eat less meat. Uh, maybe you want to drink less. Uh, maybe you want to spend more time dwelling in a sense of the goodness and the suffering, too, of the people around you, whatever it might be. Know what it is. Pick one thing, at least, that is for you what I'm calling loosely a higher road. You may already be doing it, to some extent, but you're wanting to stabilize more in it. That'll give you something concrete that you can relate when I'm going to be talking about too. All right.
Okay. So then in reference to the higher road, two major ways to be pulled increasingly effortlessly up that road. One is specific, has to do with specific ways of uh, particular things you want to promote in yourself. And the other, the second, is not specific. It's more about resting in a global ground of being, such as the global ground of being that Thich Nhat Hanh was talking about in his metaphor of the ocean and the wave, resting in the ocean. So first, specifics. I want to talk about two kinds of specifics. One being um, the pursuit of a particular result. How can we be drawn to the particular results that we care about? The results of exercise, the results of being a leader in an organization in a certain kind of way, the, result, uh, the results of you know, healthy, wholesome, happy interactions and relationships with other people drawn to certain results. The other that I'll get to in a moment is more of a focus on process, not so much results, but the process in general. So if you think about something you're trying to motivate yourself or be drawn toward, it's really helpful to imagine um, what the results would be and the rewards of those results and to focus on them. The mind can be drawn into all kinds of other directions, distractions, yes, but, what about, doubt, but in the past you gave up too soon, in the past year you quit. You're a quitter. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for sharing. I got it. Thank you. I heard it. I heard it. I heard it. You got anything new? Nope. Same old, same old. Thank you. This voice too belongs. This too belongs, as Tara Brock says, but it's not where you want to apply your attention. Where you want to apply your attention is on what is enjoyable or meaningful or otherwise valuable to you in the results you're aiming for. So if you conduct yourself in the higher road kind of way, what would be the result in an interaction, including maybe a high priority interaction like with a boss or a teenager or you know a dear friend, your partner, what would be the result that you're hoping for by walking the higher road and how good would that feel? Can you, can get, can you get a sense of how good that would feel? kind of realistically. How good would it feel that it's good for them? How good would it feel in ways that it's good for you? How might it feel good to uh, not have to take on board feeling like a bit of a schmo in how you conducted yourself, not regretting anything? How good it feels not to have regrets? How good it feels to have that blamelessness, no fault, as it says in the I Ching, no fault, no blame. How good would that feel? So focusing on the specific, visceral, emotional, the, bet, the more somatic, the more visceral, the juicier the reward is, whew, the more the mind will be inclined toward it. It's a little bit like the metaphor of holding the carrot out before the donkey, you know, if you will, the brain is the donkey, uh, the rider is you, the being broadly, and the carrot is the anticipated reward. So keeping that carrot in front of the brain, you know, squarely focused on it, will naturally tend, you, tend to draw you up that higher road to produce that kind of result. That's really useful. Um, second, the yes, second aspect that's specific, is there a way of being that you'd like to really dwell in, in, in the process of how you conduct yourself? This is not so focused on the outcomes or the results of an interaction or a behavior, an endeavor. It's more focused on your way of being along the way. How do you want to be? How do you want to be in, let's say, challenging relationships? So imagine, bring to mind, 
you know, perhaps even recently or things you're going into soon, like, you know, Thanksgiving, the holidays, um, you know, family gatherings with all kinds of people who have all kinds of opinions about public health and COVID and politics and who's right, who's wrong, who's up, who's down. Ah. Or you might think about interactions that are kind of edgy or difficult with somebody that you work with. Maybe think about how you want to be with um, an adult child or an aging parent, a relative, you know. How do you want to be in your skin? What, what do you want to occupy? Where do you want to dwell? So I want to mention a few things that you might um, get in touch with while I'm talking about it, maybe take some notes. Before tricky interactions with people, I've definitely given myself some notes, some instructions. <laughs> if I'm on the phone and they can't see me, I might be reading them, you know, reminding myself of them, uh, trying to tattoo them on the inside of my eyelid, metaphorically speaking. Anyway, um, so for you, maybe you, the word, and I'll use different words, find words that work for you, you know, calm and strong, grounded, rooted. And the feeling of this, this is how you want to be. This is how you want to be. It's a way of being in the process of interacting with other people. How do you want to be while you're, for example, doing your work? A lot of my work is conducted through writing little things to people, emails. Um, how do I want to be while I'm writing those emails? How do I want to, for example, I, I want to be open to and have a felt sense of the individual as a kind of thou that whose words I'm reading and I'm responding to. It doesn't mean we're best friends or it's going to be more than what it is, but there's a sense of the, the humanness and the relatedness, the, the common humanity-ness. We're on the same plane. We're level with each other, uh, with the other person. And maybe that's something you want to rest in yourself while you're in the process of whatever you're doing. So right here, if you could, we're gonna do a little experiential practice in a moment, identify one or more maybe images of a certain posture, a certain vibe, maybe someone who is a exemplar for you of this way of being, or perhaps additionally or altogether some words like calm strength, grounded, open and strong, that combination like a tree that's deeply rooted through which the winds of others can blow. There's an openness while also standing rooted in your own ground. Maybe a word like um, open-hearted, word like content, uncontracted, some of those unwords, unpressured, uncompelled. Maybe you, a word like curious or reserving judgment or remembering that you don't have to agree, remembering that you can take some time to think about it. Maybe these are qualities, you know, continuing to breathe. Okay, so come up with one or more that are clear for you now. Like how you'd like to be in the process of interacting with maybe a challenging person or about a challenging situation or with people in general. Okay, got it? One or more things. Now, identify and be clear about what feels good about it? What feels good about this way of being? What is meaningful? What is, what is right or virtuous or noble about this way of being as you, as you consider it? It could be simply as, you know, it feels good. I feel better about myself when I'm this way. That's perfectly adequate. Maybe it's, huh, open-hearted, grounded strength feels good. 
there's a, there's a pleasure in it even. There's kind of a relief. There's a reassurance. Oh, I'm not going to contract. I'm not going to be a jerk. I'm not going to lose my cool when I'm in this stance of open-hearted, grounded strength. Oh, it feels good. So know what feels good about it. And then bring your attention to what feels good about it and dwell there. Know that, be in touch with this way of being, maybe be rested in it even, perhaps increasingly right now, this way of being, yeah, how you want to be. Feel it and enjoy it. Inhabit it and enjoy it. And in so doing, through positive neuroplasticity, you will be gradually, gradually hardwiring that into your brain as a trait. Where we dwell in our mind, especially while it is feeling rewarding, where we dwell in our experience increasingly becomes what dwells within us in a way that's increasingly automatic and unconditional and independent of what's happening around us. That's really good. You might even, to take it one little step further, and then I'll talk more about the general ground, um, you can even imagine a situation you're going into, you'll, you'll be facing soon to come, and you can kind of imagine yourself in that situation being the, the way you want to be. So you're in the conversation, or you imagine the next time the other person kind of flies at you and you're startled. When that happens, whew, you drop into this good place, let's say. So you're imagining this, or you're imagining how you walk through your office corridors if you're starting to do that again, or uh, how you interact with someone in conversation. You're imagining how you want to be, and you're imagining especially how good it feels to be that way. So I'll be quiet for a few breaths at least while you imagine how you want to be in a challenging situation. You imagine being how you want to be. You're being how you want to be while enjoying it. And realistically imagining how well it might go or what some of the benefits might be, what some of the pitfalls might be avoided if you're rested in this way of being. Yeah. Now here's a little detail about um, one of the recent developments in our brain in evolution. It's what I call the simulator. Uh, the capacity to do mental time travel, or one aspect, and one aspect of which is called affective emotional forecasting, which we do all the time. It's got a fancy term, but it's basically simple. We imagine different ways of being. We imagine different futures for ourselves, and then kind of, you know, anticipate problems and establish our preferences by kind of running the movie. How would it feel if I do this? How would it feel if I do that? Okay. We can use this capacity of our brain in a very skillful way because what can happen is you can start to imagine certain kinds of interactions with people, doing certain kinds of things, and as you, you know, anticipate those interactions just for, you know, kind of play out the, the fantasy of it, the, the possibility of it, the movie of it, you know, for a dozen or two dozen seconds, as you imagine it, you start to realize, uh, if I go down this, if I do it this way, eh, I don't, I don't want to do that. No, I want to be this way. I want to be like this. I want to be rested in this way of being. Instead, with that interaction I'm going to be having with that person. And when you imagine being in that way, you just take a extra little time, like an extra breath or so, to imagine truly 
being in that way, you are in effect kind of training your, your brain to be that way when the chips are down, when it actually happens. And there's different research, there's different methods that talk about how effective it is to do that kind of thing. So now I want to finish on um, how we want to be in the broad in a way that is that pulls us. Everything I've said so far are different methods that pull us toward specific things um, in particular situations, relationships, interactions. Great. Now I want to talk about resting more generally in you know, the ground of all. And different people approach this in different ways. I respect however you approach it. I tend to approach it within a, you know, a kind of with informed by the Buddhist tradition, while it really including those aspects of that tradition that do point to a sense of an ultimate ground, of the ground of our universe. So in that context then, we have, for example, this beautiful quotation from Thich Nhat Hanh. I put it in the chat at 6.49 p.m. I think I can broadcast it to everyone again, and I'm gonna do that right now. So this is one way of dropping you know, gradually with practice, and it's a practice. We gradually train in our capacity to have an ongoing sense of, call it what you will, the ground of being, an inherent spaciousness, a vastness of awareness, maybe increasingly having a sense of being connected with everything, maybe even a sense of being in touch with something, perhaps the great mystery, something maybe transcendental, something as the Buddha pointed to, unconditioned, not subject to arising and passing away, meaningfully distinct perhaps from the conditioned Big Bang universe that's unfolding nearly 14 billion years after the bang. So Thich Nhat Hanh writes, where are we here? I'll just, you can see what he said in the chat. I'll just kind of summarize it. In Plum Village, we use the simple example of the wave in the water. In our life as a wave, we struggle and we have fear because we have to go up and down to be born and to die, to exist and not to exist. We can see clearly that to live the life of the wave is very difficult. But when the wave discovers it is water, then it begins to practice living as water. A wave is and is not, is up and down, is high and low, but water is utterly free. The question is, does the wave have the ability to live its true nature as water, or must it just live as a wave? A wave can practice living its life as water. We can have a sense, and we can deepen in our sense, and with practice we become more and more available to this, to living our life as water. Perhaps that's, that's to bring it kind of into a little, maybe more practical, not metaphorical terms, to resting in a sense of a, an unconditional warm-heartedness and goodwill, even with people that you're disagreeing with, who are adversaries, who perhaps you are really mobilizing to, to deal with, while still resting in and having a sense of being in touch with a kind of universal nonspecific goodwill or benevolence as part of your ground. Awareness, you know, a continuity of recollectedness, of mindfulness, a continuity of awareness. That's a kind of ground. Perhaps there's an ongoing sense of spaciousness that whatever struggle, whatever contracted knot of difficulty with another person is present, it's all happening. It's all part of a vast tapestry. However seriously messed up this particular knottedness is, truly messed up, let's say, that knot in a government or in a relationship 
or in a school situation, as bad as it is, whatever it is and how bad it truly is, that knot is part of a vast tapestry of history, culture, geopolitics, the, <laughs> the solar system, the Milky Way, the whole kitten caboodle. That's true too. We can be in touch with that as a kind of ground and we can rest in it. And the more that we have an ongoing sense of the, the underlying ground of everything, perhaps as I've been saying, as awareness, as goodwill, as spaciousness, even a sense increasingly maybe of stillness, timelessness, all rightness, fundamental all rightness. In Zen, it's called the great perfection of all. That can include many imperfections. Um, the more that we're rested in that ongoing awareness, kind of in the back of the mind, we're kind of in touch with it, or we can get in touch with it per periodically when we want, um, then we're being lived increasingly by that. We are water manifesting locally as a particular wave in this moment. But fundamentally, we have a knowing of water. We're living as water. And being lived as water, we're naturally lifted by the nature of water um, and carried along without having to push and force our way. Okay. So, you got it? How I, how I feel it kind of somatically in the body, it's a feeling of being lifted by purpose, lifted by um, wholesome intentions, lifted by wholesome qualities of character that some of which have been trained or developed over time, you know, kind of lifted by them. Uh, lived by love. What is living through you? What are the forms of contribution that are living through you naturally? It is of your nature to be helpful in these ways. You know, what is the light that's living through you? What is the love, the caring, as I said, that's living through you? What's the commitment to justice, the compassion for others that's living through you and carrying you along? Can you give over to that current? That's what it means to be pulled into unilateral virtue. All right. Well, I see hands up. Um, I'm going to tend to prioritize people who I haven't asked a question in the past, but I'm, I'm not trying to discriminate about, you know, regular participants. Uh, so that said, if it's okay, I think I'll start with you, Kathy. And, and by the way, I have an imperfect memory. So just know that I will be unfair from time to time. Um, so let's see here. So Farah, I'm going to try to get to you, and I'm going to try to regulate myself, be lifted by brevity, the soul of wit. Uh, so Kathy, I'm going to call first on you, then Chantel, uh, and then I'll try to get to you, Farah. Okay. So I'm asking you to unmute, unmute Kathy. And as I typically say, you've heard me say it, you know the drill, a question or comment that's really focused and succinct related to what I've been talking about. Okay, Kathy. So I'm really, so thank you. I'm really curious about this. Um, and the example I'm gonna bring to bear is I just went to see my father who lives a distance away. And he is, the, um, a, I'm saying this kindly, damaged goods, orphanage as a child, Emotionally, he has a hard time with anything, um, anything emotional. So visiting him is challenging. Mm -hmm. And I watch myself enroll with him. I watch myself being, um, not being triggered. And the question I have is the difference between clear seeing that allows me to operate from where I want to be versus slipping into disconnect which is how I've been trained to be, mm -hmm. right? D does that question make sense that- well, So what I hear you say, you're clear about how you wanna be, right? So then the question becomes, what, what draws you there? Or how, how can you be in touch with and even rested in how you wanna be, right? Yeah, and so, so that's the practice. 
And if I could just ask you right now to kind of play with this maybe for half a minute, um, one way is to just look at posture. How we're, you know, it's called embodied cognition. You know, like right now, Kathy, if you, want to, you know, we know each other a little bit through the, our interactions in the past. Like if you think about how you want to be, as you call it, clear seeing, which I think probably has a kind of loving um, uh, disentanglement, yes, if you will. Yes, absolutely. Okay, how would you sit? How so, would your how would your I, face be? Was, Just right now, boom, in your body. How would you sit? How would you be rested in this kind of loving disentanglement? Are you doing it? All right, that, that's an example. What what feels good about this way of being, however you want to be? I'm putting you on the spot here because I feel like I can have some latitude what, with what you. What feels good is I feel centered, I feel grounded, I feel at ease. That's beautiful. That's I, really... I feel open rather than contracted. Beautiful. Yeah. Great. Uh, now you're very bright, you're, and you're as you say about yourself, you're cognitive. So it's okay. We're gonna, we're gonna go for the go-to. We're gonna draw on your one of your superpowers. Is there a word or a little encouragement, or even you could almost say it lightly, an instruction that in language that you could give to yourself that would be a cue to help you rest and or return or return to this way of being? A word the cue or a... that comes mm -hmm. to mind is more of an image. Great. Is Simple. that of being a tree that has deep roots, Beautiful. but can be just open and, oh, the wind's blowing. Okay, we're good. Fantastic. All right, you're good to go. So just kind of ticking the boxes, you know, focusing on, you know, first of all, do you know how you want to be? Yes, you do. Okay, good. Second, can you begin to inhabit it through bodily posture or movement? Good. Through um, a certain, uh, can you recognize what feels good about it? And can you even have an image or a word that sort of cues you up? That kind of uh, is a prompt, as it were. Yes. Can you, a trail of breadcrumbs, you know, <laughs> you can find your way back to the way of being you want to promote. Super. Okay. The image, the image is really helpful. Having yeah. having an image or like yeah. you say a phrase is is super helpful. That's great. Well, thank you, that's Kathy. I'm going to move to come back, right? To yep. to pull ourselves back to the moment. Yeah, and then increasingly rest as that. And uh, it helps sometimes to kind of gird our loins, you know, to kind of gather our forces before we pick up the phone or open the door, you know, or walk into the, you know, uh, rest home, whatever it might be kind of stabilize ourselves in the way we want to be, and then we go in. Yeah. Okay. It's the opposite of the dis. My question was about the disconnect, and this is a way of staying connected. Yeah, beautiful, with yourself, which will help you stay connected to him. Okay, take care. All right. Yeah. All right, Chantel, I'm going to ask you to unmute, and if you're willing, if it's okay to turn on your camera. Chantel? Hi. Hey there, excellent. I'm Great. actually sitting in my car. I have two kids at home, so I got away for this meditation. It's my first time. I've watched a few of your videos and read some of your things, so thanks for having me. Oh, definitely. Is your car cold? <laughs> um, I live in Canada, yep. and uh, there was a blizzard for two days. It's uh, Yeah, it's quite cold out. Yeah. Okay, good. I got it. All right. What's so the I question? Well, I'm really happy I was able to join tonight's meditation. I'm, I'm really um, struggling my life right now, and I'm trying to accept that everything is happening for a reason. I'm having trouble figuring out what, what to be drawn to. Um, you know, I was uh, sort of in a relationship, and I was having really exciting feelings and feeling really um, like I could do anything and that everything was possible. And now coming out of that relationship, I'm feeling a lot of old pain that I know is underneath mm. like layers of, of childhood stuff. So I'm, you know, trying to like let that arise gently, trying to be with it. But then also like this, this yearning or this survival need to, um, you know, like start a business and, and grow and do something new. So I'm, I'm, I guess when I think of your words, like what is drawing you there? Like how, how does one try to figure out 
where she wants to be drawn. Very, uh, really, yep, yeah, um, good. So you, you're really self-aware. You're thoughtful about this. That's good. Um, I would say first, I've been generally focusing on this notion of unilateral virtue in our relationships, living by our own code, uh, focusing on cleaning up our own side of the street, which also puts us in a much stronger position to call other people, finally, to cleaning up their side of the street, too. All right. So that's the focus that I've been having, in, and also in terms of what do we want to encourage within ourselves that promotes that unilateral virtue. So what we're going to talk about here briefly is a little divergent from that, and that's it's okay. It overlaps. It's fine. Um, so first thing I heard you talk about, how do we want to be uh, with the sorrow or the hurt of a relationship breakup or the unfulfilled longing for a different relationship? How do we want to be about that? And I think it's helpful to identify how do we want to be about it, right? Thought, word, and deed. For example, we could say, well, I want to honor and include the, the loss and, and the kind of pang and the hole in my heart, and I want to honor and include my you know, legitimate desire to be in a good relationship and that it's being unfulfilled right now. It's kind of frustrated right now. I'm including that, but I don't want to be hijacked by all that. I don't want to be dragged under by all of that. I'm, I'm, I'm including it. I'm not fighting it, but I don't want it to be like a heavy stone that carries me underwater. That's a way I want to be about it. And I also want to be, um, when it feels right, active and engaged. I want to take steps. I want to be proactive and resourceful and productive um, toward what I what I really long for. I want to be mobilized. This a way of being. Let's say I'm putting words into your mouth. Maybe I'm just naming possibilities, and they come a little out of my own nature, which tends to be sort of let's let's <laughs> let's do something. But I'm just saying it. Okay, so that's a way of being. And then you we might ask, okay, what would draw us toward that way of being? Rather than white knuckling, or you know, or pushing herself to be that kind of person or be that way. Well, one good way to do that is to be very aware of a what it feels like to be this way. Whatever you've identified with the attitudes and the sense in the body, the point of view about yourself, the other qualities. Be very, be very aware of what it feels like while also really enjoying it, enjoying it, and the enjoyment trains the little inner monkey, the inner little donkey, <laughs> to go after that particular carrot. Okay. So I like what you're saying. So like, you know, it's hard, like the disentanglement part, it's hard to, because, you know, it's, it's not like a concrete loss. You feel like something could be salvaged if you only did something right. But I guess I, I just need to focus on, like you said, cleaning up my house like how how do I want to be in my life in general like despite anyone else any <laughs> nothing um just how do I right. want to be and then that's right um honoring it and and try to make it sort of or en envision it not wavering me so much right in, in those impacts exactly we can apply this basic idea of being pulled toward the good rather than pushing ourselves uphill toward it. We can apply it to anything. I apply it to things like exercising, you know, getting myself to get on the darn treadmill, uh, slog away, because it's good for me. You know, you can apply it to anything. We can also apply it to subtleties of how we are developing as, as a being or how we want to be in relationship to our pain or loss. You know, so we can apply it in all kinds of ways. And the crux of it is, Know what it feels like to be who you want to be and how you want to be, and then find what's enjoyable about it, what's meaningful and important, which will naturally draw you in that direction. Okay, I want to see. I do think I have time for one or two more people. So thanks, Chantel. Welcome to the show, as it were. I'm glad you're here. Go Canada. And, um, you know, I really wish you well. Thank, thank you. you so much. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay, Jer. I think we have time. Hello, hello, friend. So, whoops, I'm sorry. I'm going to ask you. Sorry, Ken. I'm going to come back to you in a minute. But okay, good. Hi. This is. Uh, yep. 
You're on. Yep. You're on, Jer. Okay. Thank you, Rick. Yeah. Um, so um, I interpreted one of the things you, you were saying as uh, taking on the qualities of some great role model in our lives. That's one way in. And by the way, Jerry's a friend of mine. We've known each other for a long oh, time. Oh, thank you through for our, saying that. Through our meditation it. group. Yeah. I really do. And this is Georgie. Hey. Um, so um, I've, I've used him as a role model in a number of different uh, situations uh, in my uh, imaginings. And it's taken me a while. So this is more of a comment than anything. But it's taken me a while to filter out just why this uh, this college teacher of mine over 50 years ago was was such a good role model. And mm. he was the, I finally distilled it down to that. He was kind. Mm. He just had, he was the, that, that's what the feeling that I got from him, kindness. So, yeah. and I, and I just want to absorb that from Mr. Obahowski from 50 years ago, my college French professor. Yeah. Oh, thank you for naming that. And that's a major way in to, you know, grounding ourselves in who and how we want to be, bringing to mind people for us that are models. You know, how would fill in the blank, right? How would Thich Nhat Hanh handle it? How would Michelle Obama handle it? How would, you know, Mr. Rogers handle it? Yeah. How would... um Obi Wan Kenobi handle it. <laughs> pick, pick your, pick your avatar. Okay, thanks, Jerry. You take care. All right, yeah. All right, Ken. I'm really happy. We're going to finish with you tonight. I'm asking you to unmute. Great. Hello, and thank you uh, for your availability. Huh. Uh, um, first, I ran across uh, some of your talk on a CD set teaching, and I've been using the meditation, taking in the good for years now. Uh, uh, I have started uh, trying to share that little bit with many friends, hoping some of them will uh, want to take bigger bites. So mm -hmm. I thank you for that. And oh, I'm thank you. Delighted to be here. I'm a lucky man. I'm 66 um, and life has worked out well for me. I have a lot of resources and, uh, you know, things just ended up better than I ever thought. Of course, I'm in therapy all the time. Uh, because um, I don't feel like I deserve any of it. Huh. When you were uh, talking and you uh, you raised your hand and you talked about the voice, yes, I know that voice. I have actually several of them that form a chorus. And for years, I've been aware that I have those negative voices but on the other shoulder, I have no positive voices. Uh -huh. So all of the work that I do, and I do a lot, I feel like a fraud. And, um, you know, I, I feel like the basic human condition is uh, we're not supposed to be happy. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's, uh, it's not necessary for survival. Um, so well, how, do I, there... how, how do I not be my own brick wall. Right. Well, first, I think being honest with yourself and feeling it, like it seemed like you felt it there a bit toward the end, just the sorrow and, and just the simple feeling of, uh, this doesn't feel good, you know? I try hard, I do good, I am good, and I, I still, I feel like a pho phony. I feel like a fake, an imposter. Does, I don't feel like I've earned it. I, I don't even feel like I'm allowed to have it. That There's a sorrow in that, all right? You can feel it, like, oh, what a bummer, what a drag, how unfair. So that I think there's a place for just, for including that, not being swallowed up by it or consumed by that aspect, but being honest about that part, which can then motivate oneself to say, you know, I'm, I would start swearing here, except I don't swear when I'm in a teaching role, but it's usually, but I'm gosh darn tired <laughs> of that way of being. Ain't right. I'm fed up. I've had it. You know, that sorrow can, can motivate us in a good way. Second, you might want to turn your awareness to 
uh, my material about developing a caring committee inside, exactly what you said. We can struggle with the negative voices. We can go down that road a long, long way. We're always we're always sword fighting with Darth Vader, uh, and then we become consumed there. Blech. What's more effective and really important is to internalize and grow positive resources inside that are caring and encouraging and fair and reasonable and just and supportive and compassionate and and you know useful coaches as well. That's what I call the caring committee. How can you develop more of those qualities inside? So I would encourage you, Ken, check out my material about that. You'll find it in the book, Hardwiring Happiness, where I talk about building up internal resources related to our need for connection. You'll also find it probably in my book, Resilient, in a more summary way, this idea of developing an inner caring committee. I figure, by the way, that you're standing up to get a, something to write uh, rather than just running to the bathroom to throw up. Oh, good job. You have hardwiring happiness. Good job. So caring committee, very important. I'd go to town on that one. I'd go after that one, 100%, full on. And then the rest of it, you know, like where in the world does I'm st I'm st I'm tongue tied, which is uncommon for me. <laughs> you may have noticed, like the notion somehow that it's not all right to be happy when we are, the notion that we should not enjoy the taste of the chocolate chip cookie when it's in our freaking mouth, right? The notion that we should not uh, enjoy what the Buddha called the happiness visible in this present life. You know, with the fruits of our efforts, honestly earned, All right? Like, that's crazy. Why should we not enjoy it? If they were honestly earned, if alongside our advantages, we do what we can for those who've come into this life without those advantages through all kinds of circumstances, including simply the country they were born in or the color of their skin, when, when they were born or their gender, you know, if we're, we're a decent being, why not enjoy our life? Uh, including because we recognize that lawful, earned enjoyment and fulfillment in this life is good for other people too. When you walk around, Ken, afflicted with self-doubt and these nagging voices yapping away at you, that's wear and tear on your capacity to contribute to other people. When you don't fully receive the gift from others of their gratitude to you, their respect for you, their honoring of your own efforts, their recognition of your accomplishments, when you don't receive that to yourself, you know, that, that impacts them. It's good for others for you to let in healthy and appropriate fulfillment. And this is true for everybody as well. So I just kind of want to give you that little talking to big guy, <laughs> a little bit of that straight from me to you. Uh, really, really, really important. Um, and then last, to bring it all the way around as I finish here, in a moment I'll turn it over to my my co-pilots, uh, Tom you know, and George, about um, setting up the Zoom breakout rooms. How do you want to be? Do you want to be constantly doubting yourself? Or do you want to rest in a feeling of legitimate, entitled self-worth? How do you want to be? So identify how you want to be related to this. You know, do you want to, do you want to allocate more attention and airtime to the caring committee that's building you up? rather than the inner critics and naysayers and doubters that are tearing you down. How do you want to be? And when you identify how you want to be, then I've offered a number of very practical and effective ways to dwell increasingly in how you want to be in this particular regard, or others too, to dwell there while enjoying it, while appreciating the rewards of it, which will increasingly naturally incline your mind in that direction. You okay? 
I didn't hold back. I felt you could, you're good. We could do, we could do it. And that's respect for you, man. That's respect for you. And it's respect because I'm seeing something there that's worthy of respect in who you are and how you are. It's real. Okay. Well, everybody, so if you want to play with the toys we've kind of laid out here, if you want to use the tools this week, you've got some good stuff to do, right? Um, unilateral virtue and locating, you know, um, how you want to be, right? Um, and then really focusing on what's enjoyable about how you want to be. So you're naturally pulled in that direction. While, if it's meaningful for you, staying in touch with who you already are, the good news about who you already are, living through you, lifting you and carrying you along.